ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد Dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam <coughs> we take lesson first and foremost from one of the pioneers of Islam <coughs> during the early stages of Islam when the Muslims were the minority in Mecca when Mecca was not populated by 100% muslimin rather they had the mushrikeen <coughs> that were present at that time the heads of the Quraysh were heads or were the custodians of the Kaaba at that time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his small group of followers were considered the muhajirin prior to them migrating to medina when islam was fully established one of those pioneers the brothers and sisters i wanted to highlight in this khutbah we can take lesson and make him a role model for our future generations because in this day and age the brothers and sisters <coughs> We as Muslims are suffering an identity crisis. Our youth and our shabab they don't know how to identify themselves or they've lost their identity as Muslims. You see we we get our inspiration and our role models are perhaps specific athletes or song artists or celebrities or whatever it may be. and the way to attack this is to teach our future generation about role models that Islam teaches us about the best people after the anbiya which were the sahaba radiyallahu anhum allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about these sahaba about the followers and the companions of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says radiyallahu anhum wa radu anh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah being their lord this is the ultimate goal of the muslim we want allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with us how do we do this by following the traits of these great men and women that lived with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you see when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the sahaba radiyallahu anhum it was like a a a lady that goes to a supermarket perhaps the men as well When they go to the supermarket and they choose the ripe mangoes out of these spoiled mangoes. You don't go to a supermarket and choose the bad mangoes or the bad fruits, but you choose the ripe fruits so you can take it home. Wallahi al-mathal al-a'la Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses ripe fruits. He chooses the right types of people to carry the message because wallahi brothers and sisters, if I myself were there, personally if I myself were there, you will not be muslim today because of the iman that we possess today if we were next to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam most of us would not be muslim today but because of their courage and their bravery and whatever they had to go through their thick skin that they had to go through in mecca we are muslim today one of those sahaba of the pioneers of islam was by the name of abu dhar al ghifari radiyallahu anhu also known because abu dhar was his kunya It was his nickname that was actually his daughter his real name was Jundab ibn Junada radiyallahu anhu he was one of the pioneers one of the early muslims to accept islam and abu dhar radiyallahu anhu narrates his own story 
Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, he asks Abu Dhar, he likes, you know, sometimes when we hear about new Muslims, we want to hear their stories and how they became Muslim. So, Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu, he asks Abu Dhar, he says, Ya Abu Dhar, how did you become Muslim? Explain to us, show us or tell us, how did you become Muslim? Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu narrates his own story. And he says, I was from the tribe of Ghifar, which was a, an extremely ruthless tribe, the thugs of Mecca. They had no limits to them whatsoever. And they did not respect Ashhurul Hurum, which were the sacred months in Islam or amongst the Arabs. Those were the sacred months in which the Arabs, at that time in Mecca, they had a peace treaty. They would not fight one another within these four sacred months. Except for the tribe of Ghifar, these were professional raiders. They would raid caravans, steal, cheat, kill, create bloodshed, without any limits whatsoever. So Ashur al-Hurum had no meaning to them whatsoever. Those four sacred months, they would steal, they would cheat, they would raid the caravans. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he despised that. That they were disrespected Ashur al-Hurum. So him and his brother and his mother left. They left their tribe and they settled or they stayed at the house of their uncle. When they stayed at the house of their uncle, MashaAllah, the uncle was very hospitable towards them. He treated them very well. And this made the relatives of Abu Dhar, which was around at that time, it made them envious towards the uncle. Why is he treating them better than how he treats us? So the relatives started to make these false accusations about Abu Dhar and his family. And they said to the uncle, they said, you know what? When you are gone for business and for work, Abu Dhar, his brother, he visits your wife. This was obviously a lie. So the uncle gets furious and he gets angry. He storms into the house and he starts shouting at Abu Dhar. And Abu Dhar is wondering what's going on here. Why are you shouting at me? He makes these false accusations. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he says, all the good that you've done for me is completely erased. It's out. You've completely thrown it away by these words that you have just said. So the uncle realizes he's at fault. So eventually the uncle, he's very sad and very remorseful. And he tells Abu Dhar, please Abu Dhar, just stay. And Abu Dhar says, no, it's my time to go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had a plan for Abu Dhar and his family. Anhu. Abu Dhar then continues and he goes to a city nearby Mecca. Not necessarily Mecca, but nearby Mecca. Keep in mind, brothers and sisters, this was before Nubuwa. This was before prophethood. Everything that is taking place right now is before prophethood. Abu Dhar and his brother are now residing in a place nearby Mecca. And his brother Unais was actually a businessman. So his brother each and every single day would go to Mecca for business and come back home. Until one day, Unais comes back with breaking news. And he comes back to Abu Dhar and he says, Abu Dhar, you're not going to believe it. There's a man in Mecca claiming to be a prophet. They call him Muhammad. He claims to be a prophet and he's teaching the fundamentals of Islam. The five pillars of Islam. He's teaching you to be good to your neighbors. He's teaching you to be kind to the orphan, kind to the weak. Treat them equally, all types of skin color, which was new at that time. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ was the only philosopher, only person in the entire world at that time teaching racial equality, teaching equality in all sorts. So this was strange, especially to the Quraysh. You're telling me that no matter how much wealth I have, I'm equal to my servant? I'm equal to my slave? This was something new. So Abu Dhar says, I want to know more. Tell me more. He says, oh, and then Unais, he, con he continues, and he says, but they claim he's a madman. They claim he's a sorcerer, a magician. He's crazy, something's wrong with him. And Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says, Ma ashfayta gharili. You haven't satisfied my hunger. Abu Dhar then says to Umar bin Khattab, he says, I was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I heard this news for three years. But he didn't know how to worship Allah. Then Umar bin Khattab says, how did you pray then? If you were worshipping Allah, then how did you pray before Islam? He says, whatever direction I faced, I prayed. Whatever way I prayed, if I sat down and I meditated, whatever way I just told myself I was worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So you can see Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he never associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never committed shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he heard this news from his brother, he said, Ma ashfayta qalili. You haven't satisfied my hunger, my thirst, my crave. I want to know more. So he investigated. He himself radiallahu anhu went to Mecca. And then when he gets to Mecca, keep in mind, you know, he doesn't really know. He's not too familiar with Mecca. He goes to the first person he sees. And he says, and he says Oh person, direct me to Muhammad. Where is Muhammad? And the man, instead of directing him to Muhammad, he directs him to the Kaaba. And he says, Come to the Kaaba. So he takes him to the Kaaba. Keep in mind the tribe of Ghifar, if they, didn't, if they did not respect Ashur al Hurum, which were the four months, why would they respect the Kaaba? So they didn't know what the Kaaba was. So Abu Dhar goes to the Kaaba. It's not like he said, I'm going to go to the Kaaba and just wait for the Prophet. Perhaps he's going to come. He didn't know where it was. So Abu Dhar goes to the Kaaba. The man takes him and he says, you know, Abu Dhar is thinking that he's going to take him to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the man takes him to a group of Quraysh. And he says to the group of Quraysh, Ya Quraysh, this man right here, he's looking for Muhammad. And the Quraysh get up and they start beating Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. And he says, Ka'annani nusub ahmar. He says, when I got beat up by those groups of Quraysh, it was like nusub ahmar. He describes his body like how the idols at that time when they used to sacrifice animals for the specific idols that they would sacrifice for, they would tie their animals to that idol, to that specific idol, and they would slaughter the animal and the blood would gush on the, an the idol and it would drench the idol in blood. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu describes his own body as nusub ahmar. I looked like that idol drenched and soaked in blood. But keep in mind, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was from the tribe of Ghifar. He was well built. So he probably took out three or four people, but obviously he was outnumbered. So they took him out. So then he says, I stayed in the Kaaba. I didn't know where to go. I stayed in the Kaaba for 30 days, not knowing where to find Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He looks, you know, he can't find him. No one's going to tell him where he is. Because obviously they were anti-Islam at that time. They were not going to t tell Abu Dhar where the Prophet ﷺ is. And on top of that, they didn't tell him or they didn't give him any food. Because he was looking for Islam. So they didn't give him any food. So Abu Dhar anhu says, I survived off Zamzam water. For 30 straight days, all I had to drink was Zamzam water. Now that might be amazing to us, mashallah, that's amazing, the barakah of Zamzam water. But what, what is more interesting thing, the more interesting thing is, Abu Dhar says about himself, he says, when I survived off that Zamzam water for 30 days, I started to develop folds on my stomach because of the Zamzam water. Now that time was strange. At this time, maybe 90% of us have folds on our stomachs. But Abu Dhar at that time was something, it was something abnormal. It was strange. So you can imagine when he told the Sahaba, I had folds on my stomach, Umar al Khattab is probably saying, wow, that must have been a lot of Zamzam water at that time. Eventually, one day, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, you know, he's looking around at the people, they're making tawaf, and at that time, it wasn't like now, mashallah, the tawaf is only around the Kaaba. At that time, they used to make tawaf around the Kaaba and around their idols. Perhaps they wanted to make Hajj that year and what they would do is for example They would have idols for fertility for example or for wealth or for status and that specific year Whatever you wanted you wanted perhaps you wanted a child you wanted marriage you wanted wealth you wanted status You would go to a specific idol for that and make tawaf or touch it while you're making tawaf around the Kaaba The biggest idol that they had was Hubal which was located inside the Kaaba so you can see the the Kaaba was, you know, had, had surrounded idols around it before the liberation of Mecca. So Abu Dhar one day, he sees these two girls, these two women, they were making tawaf and they touch Isaf and Nailah, two idols, Isaf and Nailah. And these two girls, every time they were making tawaf, they would touch Isaf and Nailah. And Abu Dhar obviously he knew 
the knowledge of the idols. Isaf and Nailah, according to Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says Isaf and Nailah were actually people before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them into stone on the spot. Why? Because before they were stones, they wanted to get married and they were from two different tribes. And their people prohibited them to get married. So what happened was they wanted to, wa'iyadu billah, commit zina in front of the Kaaba. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them into stone on the spot. And years later, generations later, for some unknown reason, the mushrikeen decide to take them as their gods. And you can see what shaitan does. He just, once you go into this, he throws you in dungeons of darkness. You just keep on going into this spiral. So he, Abu Dhar sees this and he says, and he utters words, and he says to the two women, why don't you, O oh two women, make these two idols, Isaf and Naila, have intercourse with one another? That's a big no-no, you don't say things like that. So the scholars have said, perhaps they didn't hear Abu Dhar the first time, so he shouted it. He wanted to make sure they heard it. He said, hey, you two, the ones that are touching Isaf and Naila, have them come together and commit zina. And once they heard this, you know, that's a disrespect to their gods. Once they heard this, they shouted and they started wailing and crying and running in the streets of Mecca. And they crossed paths with none other than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asks these women, what's going on? Did someone die? Why are you screaming? They said, there is this lunatic next to the Kaaba. He said something, tamla ulfam. He said something that fills the mouths. He said something about Isaf and Naila, about our gods. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, we gotta meet this man. Whoever is going to disrespect their idols, we got to meet this man. So him and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, they go to the Kaaba and they see Abu Dhar. And the first thing the Prophet sallam asks him, he says, where are you from? And Abu Dhar says, ana min al ghifar I am from the tribe of Ghifar. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon hearing this, he is shocked. Ghifar, the ruthless thugs of Mecca, the professional raiders, you are coming here to accept Islam while my own people, the elites of the Quraysh, the influential amongst Mecca are not taking my message and here you have the ruthless thugs of Mecca coming to accept Islam. So he places his head on his, he places his hand on his head out of shock and Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu says, you know, I was a bit, I was afraid that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't like that I told him I was from Zayfar, so I tried to extend my hand to take the Prophet's hand away from his forehead and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu smacks my hand away and he says, don't you dare touch the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You see, because they didn't know who he was and they perhaps thought that he was an enemy so he smacks his hand, he says, don't you dare touch Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Eventually, Abu Dhar becomes Muslim. And at this time, at Mecca, Muslims were the minority. They used to pray in Dar al-Arqam, it was very secret. They used to pray not in public, but in private. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, okay Abu Dhar, now you are officially a Muslim. Uqtum imanak. Hide your iman. Don't show people that you are a Muslim. Abu Dhar says, okay. Days pass, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he goes to the Kaaba now, in front of a group of Quraysh, and he says, Ya ma'ashar al-Quraysh, inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. He goes in front of a group of Quraysh, and says, I bear witness and testify that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and Muhammad is his last messenger. So obviously, you don't do this, obviously he was trying to hide his iman, but the Prophet ﷺ tells him to hide his iman, but he didn't listen to the Prophet ﷺ. And he goes out publicly declaring his Islam. <clears throat> and that group of Quraysh get up and they start beating him. كَأَنَّهُ نُصُبْ أَحْمَرُ And he was blood, bloodied, drenched and soaked in blood. And he wipes off his blood with a smile now. Because he knows the reason why he's getting beat up. 
The next day, day number two, he goes to a different group of Quraysh and says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah and gets beaten up again. Day in and day out, he does this every single day until Al Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, the brother of Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib, عنه, he stops the Quraysh. He says, Ya Ma'ashar al Quraysh, what do you think you are doing? Who do you even know who you're beating up? And they say, No, he's just a Muslim. He's going to beat up a Muslim. He says, This man is from the tribe of Ghifar. If you kill him, if something happens to him, all of your trade and your business to Asham will cease to exist because they will take avenge for their brother's death and steal and kill each and every single one of you. Once they heard that Abu Dhar was from the tribe of Ghifar, they stepped back. Oh, Ghifar, I'm not going to touch Ghifar. So you see Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he kept on doing this each and every single day until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Abu Dhar, I think you need to go. You can't stay here causing trouble and just saying your shahada everywhere you go, this is causing problems. He tells Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, go back to your people. Go back to your people and when I have fully established myself, then come back to me. When you have heard that I am fully established and fully settled, then come back to me. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he listens to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he goes back to his tribe. When he goes back to his tribe, he teaches them about Islam. Keep in mind, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam perhaps maybe a week or two. It wasn't too long. And he goes back to his tribe teaching them about Islam. Half of his entire tribe becomes Muslim. And the other half says we will wait to give bay'ah or pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ himself when we meet him. And eventually the Prophet ﷺ gets to Medina, he has fully established himself. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, now he hears that the Prophet ﷺ is fully settled, he goes to Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ hears and sees this huge dust cloud coming to Medina. And they, the, the Sahaba, they were afraid, so they started to grab their weapons, thinking that it was in foreign, a foreign enemy, perhaps it was the Mushrikeen trying to attack the Muslims. And the Prophet says, Kun Aba Dhar, relax, it is just Abu Dhar. Radiallahu anhu. Abu Dhar comes with his entire tribe, all accepting Islam. In fact, his rival tribe, which was Aslam, they, when they found out the tribe of Ghifar became Muslim, they said, I, we want to become Muslim too. Two tribes becoming Muslim from the hands of one man that learned Islam in two weeks. Learned Islam in two weeks. And two tribes became Muslim. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the little effort that we do for our da'wah of being Muslim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in our da'wah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in our actions, that we see our actions in this dunya and in the hereafter. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruhu innahu wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen nabiyyina muhammadi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. I will conclude with the story of Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu so we can focus on the lessons and the benefits of what we can take from this story. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, obviously, we can mention his, the way he passed away, the way he lived his life. Inshallah, that will be your homework assignment. We will only focus on the lessons that we can take from the story that we mentioned in the first khutbah. The first lesson that we can take from this story of Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu is if you are looking for change, if you are looking for guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you. Those that seek guidance, Allah will guide you. The Quran, dear brothers and sisters, is hudan lil muttaqeen. It is not guidance for everyone. 
It is guidance for those that are conscious about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not be your inspiration and your role model for this dunya. He will not be your role model for this dunya. If you were chasing for al-akhirah, if you were chasing for the hereafter, then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will be your role model. He will, be, he will be your influence. He will teach you how to prepare yourself for al-akhirah. But if you want to know things about dunya, and how to do this in dunya, how to do that in dunya, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa will not be your influence. So we see that if you are looking for guidance, if you are looking for change, you have to take that first step towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't just sit at home and expect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you become a better Muslim when you haven't done anything to make that change. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, he did that to make that change. When he heard about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa by his brother, he didn't just stay home and say, okay, that guy's crazy. He went to go and investigate and went to Mecca himself. That's number one. Number two, convey the message even if it is one verse. بَلِّغُوا عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً As the Prophet ﷺ says, don't limit yourselves, oh brothers and sisters. And you say to yourself, oh I only know so much about Islam, I only know very little. And you don't share it with your co-workers, with your neighbors, with your Muslim family members, with your non-Muslim family members. Convey the message even if, it is, even if it is one verse. Number three, change is possible for anyone. Do not underestimate the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Bedouin made the dua, the, the dua for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the same Bedouin that urinated in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after this, he, when he thought the Sahaba, the Sahaba wanted to beat him up because he urinated in the masjid, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prevented them from doing so, the better when he cried out to Allah, he said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and Muhammad and no one else. Now this dua is strange, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, لَقَدْ حَجَّرْتَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ وَاسِعًا You have restricted something very vast. The mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is for everyone. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent a messenger to the greatest tyrants in the history of mankind to the most evil person that ever existed which was Fir'aun that was because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Fir'aun considered himself Rabbukum al-A'la your God the most high couldn't Allah just kill him on the spot right there but out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he sends him Musa or Moses alayhi salam change is possible for anyone Abu Dhar, the thug of Mecca, amongst the ruthless tribes of Mecca, accepts Islam. While Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, the people and the elites of the Quraysh did not accept Islam. Change is possible for anyone. Look at the likes of Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu anhu. He, radiallahu anhu, was a man that tried to assassinate the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now he is buried right next to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also amongst the promised paradise. Change is possible for anyone. Number four is courage. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu taught us that you have to have courage. Especially in the days that we are living in today. We have to have courage brothers and sisters. We have to be proud of who we are. Proud of our identity. Proud of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. You see, it's, it's sad that Muslims are running away from the truth. And people that don't have Islam, they are trying to find the truth. Muslims are running away from Islam. And non-Muslims are running towards Islam. We have to have courage, brothers and sisters. Be proud of who we are as Muslims. Number five is verifying the truth. If you hear rumors, if brothers and sisters are saying things about certain brothers and sisters, verify it. Don't just listen to it and accept it with open ears. Verify what you hear. Make sure what you hear is not just a rumor or some gossip that's spreading around the community perhaps. Verify the truth. Number six, and that is the last one. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says an authentic hadith, لا تحقرن من المعروف شيئا ولو أن تلقى أخاق بوجه الخلق He says, don't ever belittle a good deed even if it is smiling at the face of your brother or sister. Never belittle a good deed. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu spent two weeks with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Was he an alam? Was he a scholar? Was he a faqih? Was he a person that knew fiqh? 
But he was a mufti later during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. But at this time, he didn't know anything about Islam. He only knew the very fundamental, the basic fundamentals of Islam. Two weeks time, he goes back to his people. An entire tribe and his rival tribe become Muslim after two weeks of a workshop with the Prophet ﷺ. Don't ever belittle a good deed you do. You smile at someone is a good deed. You're kind to someone is a good deed. On the day of judgment, on your mizan, on your scale of good deeds, you will see your good deeds piled high. And you're wondering why. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you, Oh, so and so, you've smiled at everyone you've met. Muslim or non-Muslim. You've smiled. You were kind to those that were weak. You were kind to them. You were kind to everyone. You were generous to everyone. And your good deeds will skyrocket. And you will see it. Never be little a good deed, brothers and sisters. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of those good deeds that we participate in and involve ourselves in. We also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also to unite us with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in Jannah al-Firdaus al-A'la when we ourselves can ask Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu about the story of how he became Muslim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusallu ala ala nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamid majid wa barak ala Muhammad وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد